Hello and welcome to LMD's World Environment Day panel discussion where the conversation is going to revolve around nature-based solutions to enable Sri Lanka's economy to prosper with purpose. Today I have with us four personalities uh, who are ideal to talk about this and just to give them an introduction, I have Randula De Silva who is the CEO and founder of Good Life X and with us we have Arushka Vijay Singha, the co-founder and director of Centre for a Smart Future. We have with us Shirani Asratna, the Senior Advisor to Biodiversity Sri Lanka, President of the Institute of Environmental Professionals, and former country representative of IUCN Sri Lanka and former head of the Regional Business and Biodiversity Program of IUCN Asia. And of course, last but not least, Shalna Pereira, the founder of Retrace Hospitality. Welcome to the panel discussion and thank you so much for being with us. Let's start off the discussion by setting the tone. Um, Chalana, Shirani, I'm going to uh, put my first question to you. When we say nature-based solutions, especially talking about it from the perspective of Sri Lanka, what exactly do we mean? What is the definition of nature-based solutions? Okay. So, um, nature-based solutions are solutions that come from nature. So, they are na solutions that are inspired by nature. So, this has come into focus uh, more recently. And uh, we in Sri Lanka have living examples of uh, nature-based solutions. For example, if you can take your mind back to the tsunami that we had recently, uh, where, uh, you know, mangrove systems, wherever we had uh, mangrove systems along the coastal belt, uh, villagers, communities were quite, you know, quite uh, safe from the tsunami, not that they were completely safe, but they were safer than other people. So actually tsunami, the, the mangroves acted as a barrier and even coral reefs for that matter. So these are solutions that are inspired by nature that actually have a benefit to communities and the social system. And we have many more examples in Sri Lanka. For example, if you take another, it's reforestation because when you re reforest, the trees sequest carbon and then that becomes a solution for nature. So these are the kinds of examples that Sri Lanka, being a country blessed with natural resources, can take forward. And we are taking them forward in a, a very systematic manner. Chalna, what is your take on it? Uh, sure, thanks uh, for having us. And to, to echo what, say, uh, what Shirani is saying, uh, nature-based solutions are all around us. And a large part of the global economy, and as a result, the Sri Lankan economy, has been built from nature, but in an extractive manner. So when we talk about NBS, nature-based solutions today, we're really talking about solutions that take from nature while giving back to nature. So it's replenishing, or in other words, regenerating the natural resources that we have otherwise been exploiting. So nature-based solutions, in a modern sense, uh, are influencing or inspiring, as Shirani said, with design. You look at biomimicry or biophilic design. A lot of research and development across industries and sectors has been based on extracting from nature. Pharmaceuticals is a great example. We have forests in this country that have actually influenced global pharmaceuticals, but we don't harness that. If we look at tourism, which is my area of expertise, our product is our biodiversity. So it's harnessing that as well in the right way, which means we have to regenerate the ecosystems to ensure we have high value tourism that we're striving for. So every sector in the country um, is linked to nature-based solutions. IT BPO as well, because it's powered by human capital and we are a result of what we eat, how we spend our free time, and all of that is very much linked to biodiversity. Thank you, Chalna. Um, Anushka, if I bring you in here, uh, so Chalnam is talking about different sectors from tourism to IT. As an economist, uh, why do we have to invest or why do, why, why, what is the importance of really investing in and harnessing the power of nature-based solutions for Sri Lanka? Thanks for having me. I think um, the starting point really has to be that economists and those in charge of economic growth and economic development have done a very poor job of thinking about the role of nature in the economy. I mean, look at the metric that we often use to talk about growth. It's GDP, gross domestic product. It's one of the most outdated measures of economic growth and prosperity because it almost, uh, so you can actually add to GDP by degrading the environment. So you have um, the, the price of 
plastic water bottles in the ocean, the more you add, it actually adds to GDP. Um, the price of a tree left standing is not counted in GDP, but the tree cut down is actually adding to GDP. So we have a fundamental problem with how we value uh, nature and how that value gets captured in how we consider economic growth and how we measure growth. So, uh, I mean, it's now I think well established that we need to consider nature and natural capital as a key part of our economies. Um, and as both uh, Chalan and Shirani mentioned, you know, there's very clear uh, cases for, for doing that. I think the struggle still is, apart from it being in in, uh, in certain pockets or certain industries, certain sectors, in Sri Lanka I think we have the more fundamental challenge of putting nature and perhaps nature-based solutions at the heart of how we grow the economy and how we think about economic growth and our conception of uh, development and what our priorities are. Anshka, you spoke of case studies and examples. Can we briefly touch on a few just to let our viewers know like which countries are doing it right now? Well, I think at this point in time, all countries, including a lot of developing countries, are doing it right to varying degrees. I think in some countries, particularly in um, um, Northern Europe, in Scandinavian countries, they have gotten a lot better at truly integrating nature into the economy, truly seeing it as a growth driver, not only seeing built capital as a growth driver, but also seeing natural capital as a growth driver. Um, in our part of the world, I mean, there are, uh, it, it may not be mainstream across the economy. Many of the developing countries have our challenges, but in the global south, you have countries like Costa Rica that are standout examples of it. Even, you know, countries um, like Thailand, you have in Bangkok certain new approaches to urban development that considers nature better. So I think everyone is doing it. Um, a lot of instances, it's being driven by young people or people with new ideas being allowed to come to the fore. I think that's a challenge in Sri Lanka. Our development paradigm tends to be dominated by uh, traditional thinking and older people, but that's changing. I mean, many of uh, the people today on the panel are involved in new things as well. So I'm hopeful, but I think we need to do things faster. Thank you, Anshka. Just yes, adding a, a little example from Sri Lanka. A few years ago, a study was done on the Muthurajavela wetland. Now, as you know, it's a wetland, urban wetland, very close to uh, Colombo. And uh, the study was to look at the flood retention potential of Muthurajavela. Actually, it's enormous, you know, what the marsh does to retain the floods. And actually, without the infrastructure that may be required to retain those floods, this marsh was doing an enormous job in uh, trying to retain the floods, flood waters from the Colombo area. So, I mean, these are some really vivid examples that wetlands especially uh, need to be restored and uh, brought back to their former status. And also because, as you know, they are feeding grounds for shrimps and, uh, you know, uh, fish and prawns, I mean, other, other types of, you know, uh, organisms. So uh, it also has an impact on the fishery potential. So uh, there are a few uh, economic uh, case studies that have been done in Sri Lanka, especially also on you know, these, uh, you know, cascading water systems that, you know, have been part of our culture for years and years. You know, these actually provide agricultural systems and other social infrastructure a huge uh, boost uh, and uh, I think many more, as uh, Anushka says, should be, uh, you know, uh, documented uh, in a country like Sri Lanka with so many years of history. I think quick point to add to that um, is again this concept of uh, the missing prices in the economy. We don't seem to put a price on some of these ecosystem services or nature-based uh, solutions that could be could be there. So Shirani mentioned the value of the the wetlands for. Uh, flood prevention. You have Colombo, which is the only capital city with Ramsar wetland status, and uh, the value of those wetlands in terms of carbon sequestration, pollution control, um, air community benefits. community benefits. I mean, it's remarkable that we tend to still see something like these wetlands as a place for, as a dumping ground or as a nuisance or, you know, or smelly swamp. Something to reclaim. Swamp, something to reclaim for beautification, uh, strange uh, conceptions of beautification. So I think again there it goes back to this idea of what we value and how that then feeds into the price for and the values associated with nature-based solutions. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Rantula, if I turn to you, Anushka was talking about uh, young people doing new things. Talking about Sri Lanka and how we can really uh, take nature-based solutions to a new level, especially when we are going global, catering to global markets, 
how do you think we should be looking inwards um, at, at using our resources, not in a way that we are only using them, but also giving back to them? Um, thank you for having me here and thank you for that question. Um, I think like, like the entire panel echoed, what really needs to shift first is our perspective of how we see ourselves and what, what we see when we look inwards. Um, the sense of place right now is very important. What, what is Sri Lanka? And what do we see in Sri Lanka when we look inward, when we talk about our natural resources that are in abundance? What does these resources stand for us? What does it mean for us? For some, it can just mean, oh, bunch of commodities for us to ship outside. And that has been what has been seen for very many, many years. And that's what we need to change. Yes, we are blessed with abundant resources. And for some reason, even though our practices have been so extractive, nature keeps giving us um, because Sri Lanka is such a rich and fertile ground and ecosystem but we can't keep going on like that and in order for us to really look inward and cater to the emerging conscious consumers of the world we need to really course correct uh, on how we work on the nature-based resources we have and how do we convert it to not an extractive way of building solutions and giving sharing these, uh, these resources with the world, but how do we regenerate? How do we replenish what we have? Because sooner or later, very soon actually, the consumers of the world will reject every extractive practice that is coming from everywhere in the world. So we are going to be irrelevant and insignificant and off the map very soon um, if we continue the extractive ways of doing things and, and using these resources. So how do we give back more than we take? Um, is the perspective um, to look inward uh, and also to understand the values that we hold in our back gardens, really, uh, simply put. I mean, uh, in the recent work that we did uh, in the Lost Ingredients Lab, um, there was a very young entrepreneur who was uh, mostly a tech-based uh, tech entrepreneur who called and asked, why are you working in jackfruit and go to color? W what's there in those products um, to take global? I mean, it's just what we have as curry. Uh, so, so the 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 value of what we hold in word um, and, and what it means to the world needs to be understood uh, in a very deep sense and, and to be tapped into uh, in that regenerative perspective so that the solutions that we create out of those um, nature-based resources are holistic um, for the local communities as well as the global consumers who are using it overall. And uh, like Anushka said, a lot of young people are coming back to Sri Lanka and a lot of people who are in Sri Lanka um, with young perspectives or fresh perspectives are shifting this narrative now. So it's a great time to be having this conversation and to be alive in. Randula, you spoke of global consumers and not being rejected in the near future. Uh, Chalna, can I bring you in here talking of giving what we have, of course, in a regenerative way. How can we really keep the global consumer interested in us for the long run? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And I think we've typically been, as an island, a reactive uh, producer and a reactive market. But if you look at the heritage of the country, uh, in ancient times, as Shirani referred to our, our historic heritage, it was very much circular in practice and regenerative, right, in, in, in the most part, especially our agriculture, our construction. We were not bringing things in to build and su uh, sustain our lifestyles. So from a consumption perspective, if we take key pillars of the economy, tourism being one, export agri being another, our legacy markets and the high value markets for these still remain uh, Western Europe, Northern Europe, and a smaller extent North America and Australia, right? And, and a growing extent in the Far East, which have similar consumption and buying patterns to those legacy markets. They're shrinking in our size because we're losing relevance in the eyes of those markets, which is a shame. And our geopolitical alignment with larger regional players means we are naturally attracting different emerging markets, which is not a bad thing but it's about recognizing the pockets within those markets to harness because there's tremendous value and tremendous values alignment in consumers from India, China, Russia, etc., from a niche sector. So why I'm saying this is because tourism in Sri Lanka, more than 75% is leisure-based and comes in still through the traditional agency model, which means we are dependent on representatives overseas to try direct traffic to the country. We have a growing share of FIT, which is free independent travelers that are coming in on direct bookings, but the bulk of our volume is based on agents. These agents now will start demanding for standards that look at carbon footprint, impact to supply chains, 
experiences based on nature and not just reacting to fancy wildlife photography and promotional campaigns when they know actually a lot of the luxury hotels built near wildlife parks are built on encroached illegal lands, right? So, so much capital in this country has gone towards illegal activity. And I'm not going to say what is good or what is bad, but what is happening is consumers are aware of the transparency, not only in pricing, but in actually what is being delivered on the ground. So tourism is one example that summarizes the whole economy because your supply chain depends on food, it depends on furnishing, it depends on the real estate development and construction sector, which typically the whole island is a piece of real estate. We've seen it as, okay, let's cut a tree and build an eco resort. That doesn't work. And travelers are recognizing that very quickly, right? And we need to t talk about carrying capacity because if you are talking about nature-based solutions and what we can sustain, there is a capacity. And that's not a bad thing, that's a great thing. But as Anushka mentioned, we've been measuring on billions of dollars and millions of arrivals. I think we can achieve billions of dollars with perhaps hundreds of thousands of arrivals. And that will really allow us to harness our full potential. Thank you, Shalna. Uh, Shirani, if I loop you in here, earlier you were talking about, always thinking about the repercussions, the connectiveness that we have and Sri Lanka being such a, such a hot spot for biodiversity, something we do today is going to have a domino effect for better or worse. Talking about high value tourism and how we can really uh, offer something great for a good price but without uh, without having uh, negative uh, negative uh, repercussions along the way. Talking about high value tourism, how would you say uh, that, how ready is Sri Lanka to really think of um, the do's and the don'ts and the domino effect of our actions? Actually, um, Sri Lanka is a country that has a huge tourism potential where nature is concerned. And I don't think we have actually taken that very seriously. Because when we go to other countries, we see how they kind of, you know, use that to the best advantage. Uh, fortunately for us, some of the higher end, uh, you know, um, tourism uh, chains have realized that. And we have some very good chains here that are actually looking at it very, very seriously. Now, recently of late, I've been working with a, a biodiversity a private sector oriented platform where the tourism sector is one that works very closely with us. Now, there are many examples, and I don't want to mention chains here, where uh, the whole concept is nature-based. And uh, they have tried to bring the Sri Lanka's culture, society, uh, together with the beauty that is around the place into one cocoon and trying to sell that. And, you know, that's the kind of thing that we should be looking at and not these small, uh, you know, and in fact, actually, uh, the small and medium enterprises are required along the value chain. But this is the sector that we need to bring up. I, I think our larger, uh, you know, um, chains have now realized the uh, selling potential of ethical tourism. And th the focus that we should put is more towards us of small and medium enterprises, bring them up on board, let them learn from the, you know, uh, bigger chains. And there are so many examples that, you know, we uh, have uh, that, uh, you know, we actually get the better price for what we, we have. So it is, we are getting there and the other thing I want to mention is that the Sri Lankan government where policy is concerned is also quite, you know, serious about it. For example, we have got uh, the, the National Biodiversity Strategic Action Plan that looks at bring our biodiversity uh, not in a sort of a, 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 a diminishing uh, way that we have now. When we say we are a biodiversity hotspot, that means that our biodiversity is going, going drastically going down. So we don't want that to happen. So the NBSAP is looking at bringing the biodiversity back to where the glory that it was. So we do have the policy documentation. We have the action plans. Now the uh, UNFCC, uh, you know, uh, uh, na national determined contributions is looking at increasing our forest cover to 32 percent, which is also a, a fantastic thing. So we need to, you know, bring the policies into action and bring all the stakeholders, uh, you know, to act accordingly. It's not just the state that has that responsibility. It all of us have it within ourselves as well as also our corporate sector. So these kinds of things should be done by us if we ask what can we do to support. I think this is where we, our focus should be. 
Thank you, Shirani. Before we go into the actions, uh, you paved the way to the next part of the conversation, which is how we are faring in terms of meeting our climate targets. We're signing a lot of agreements, like you said, policies are in place. Um, I'm sure there's room for improvement as well. I'm going to uh, throw my next question to the entire panel on how you think Sri Lanka is faring in terms of meeting our climate targets. Okay, so uh, let me again uh, go back. I, I mean, I since my most of my recent work is with the private sector, let me bring them in. Now, uh, a lot of companies are trying to become net zero. Now, that is very important to them. So there are a host of things that they are trying to become energy efficient, more energy efficient, looking at even, uh, maybe it's a tea company, but looking at something that is completely unrelated to their type of work, but trying to, you know, sequest carbon, trying to, you know, get the restoration act going. And there are many, many uh, companies that are now trying to become uh, net zero. So this is a very good trend and I think uh, we platforms like Biodiversity Sri Lanka for, for fostering that and trying to get them more and more into that and also with the global dialogue. So uh, where the private sector is concerned, I think there is a huge effort in trying to you know meet these NDCs and uh, of course I cannot say uh, that uh, the reforestation rates are going down or you know things like that but the the, the sector is looking at restoring. Uh, we, we have many examples of companies putting in a lot of money uh, to restore, uh, you know, degraded forest lands, mangrove stands, uh, you know, and understanding the value that there, there can be, uh, you know, mangrove sequest as much as uh, double the amount of terrestrial, uh, you know, plants. And uh, the carbon sequestration is huge. So companies can actually benefit from that by, you know, looking at their net zero programs and plans and things like that. And renewable energy has become more and more important to in today's context and you know they are trying to reduce on minimize uh, you know uh, using uh, fuel based uh, energy and going more into renewable sources so uh, for me it's it's kind of positive and I'm seeing a, a kind of positive trend even though our emit emittance is really low we don't emit carbon it's very very low it's 0.3 percent of the global uh, you know uh, uh, carbon uh, emissions that uh, we do we are but we are a very vulnerable country uh, Sri Lanka as you can see even the monsoons patterns are changing a lot of uh, changes are taking place with climate so the, our community should be made and ready and that's why nature-based solutions play a huge role because they can actually assist the, the communities to uh, be resilient uh, to the impacts of climate change and we can use global dialogue to get money to this country and uh, the, the, the UNFCC uh, conference of parties now recently the latest one is trying to give more and more funds to vulnerable countries to let the uh, communities get more and more uh, resilient so I think you know we have to maximize I mean I think the government and its negotiating partners should be able to master these finances to Sri Lanka and uh, assist the uh, communities to become more and more resilient to the impacts of climate change Anshka, do you share this optimism? I think it, we have to be optimistic, otherwise I don't think we'll, we'll get anywhere because there's a lot of doom and gloom around. Um, but I think one thing we have to recognize is, and your question about climate targets, is that we can't separate out climate targets or climate ambition from a country's larger development goals, development ambitions, ambitions of uh, people around prosperity. And I think that is where this time around, this new uh, era or new paradigm that we're going into has to necessarily link nature, society, business and government. If we don't do that, we will continue to have what we've had for so long where nature or the environment is kind of another sector, compartmentalized. So you have construction, tourism, manufacturing, environment. You can't, that era is over. I mean, environment is underpinning everything that we do including how we grow the economy. So, I mean, Shirani talked about, for instance, uh, um, uh, climate ambitions here around renewables or reforestation. The nuance there, there matters. There are examples of where reforestation or uh, replanting around, um, you know, rainforest borders has been done together with the communities in order to make sure that there's sustainability, not just going and dropping plants then assuming that everything will be fine. Whereas, on, in contrast, you also have other companies well-meaning, 
but they would go and do a mangrove project where they just go and plant something, not thinking about the community, not thinking about maintaining it. Um, uh, there's also, you know, all this talk about EV vehicle, EVs and going electric in our transport system. Um, Well-intentioned plans to completely electrify our uh, three-wheel uh, fleet, but without understanding, A, where is the power going to come from? You're still going to use electricity. And what's the behavior and the live reality of people who drive those vehicles. Uh, you and I may have the luxury of going to a supermarket charging point, doing our grocery shopping while we're charging it with a fast charger for 30 minutes. A three-wheel driver doesn't have that luxury. And you have three-wheel drivers who live in low-income communities which are concentrated hotspots and all of them charging it overnight in a concentrated hotspot. Uh, so I'm saying you have to think of the climate ambition along with social realities and the development goals and my concern for while I do share the optimism my worry is that we're continuing to see it in these silos and not understanding how each of these link together and it's this is not new you know other countries have done it so we can't there's no excuse for us to get it wrong by saying okay we'll do a electric mobility project here in isolation we'll do a reforestation project here in isolation will do an ecotourism project here in isolation. So I, I think that's the larger point I want to make. Climate ambition, climate targets, I think we, there's a greater recognition. We're moving forward, but it has to necessarily integrate with the other ambitions of the country. Rantala, what are your views on this, on how to break this ad hoc cycle? Yeah, I think Anushka beautifully nailed it on the head on the connectedness um, on, a, on a macro perspective. What's also important when we go micro at an organizational level to not look at restoration or conservation or um, meeting your uh, you know, um, net zero targets as a box to tick, um, as, as one other project to do in order to appear great in front of your stakeholders or great in front of your consumers. But if you are able to transform the way you work as an entire organization, your organization itself is a part of a larger ecosystem that is functioning for the well-being of the community and the nature for profit. We're not talking about um, a, a charity efforts here. We are talking about an entity that works for profit but counting nature as a part of its stakeholders. How do you function then? And this is what we try to do at Good Life X. Um, enable uh, organizations to make this transition happen. Um, it's, it's not a daunting task, it's just a shift of perspectives. It's, it's just flipping the way you look at what you do already and internalizing these issues without taking it as an external thing to solve. And that's how the division happens. That's how you go into a silo uh, of working alone without treating it as an entire connected system. And it's happening at a micro level as well as, like Anushka mentioned, as, um, as, a, as a, at a country level. And the way to kind of break that barrier is to understand that it is only possible if you look at it as a whole and shift, make that shift within from the core of how you operate and why you exist as an organization in itself. So I was, uh, I mean, the sustainable development goals are really important because, you know, it integrates the whole gamut of sustainability for Sri Lanka to be driven as a sustainable nation. Now, um, the SDGs are interconnected and uh, the goals that we are looking at where uh, biodiversity is concerned or environment is concerned are life on land, life beneath the, uh, beneath water, you know, the and then of course climate action, working in partnership. Now these are the goals that we are, you know, concentrating on. Now to take away from this ad hocness that you spoke of, uh, we are trying to encourage companies to report towards the SDGs because Sri Lanka as a nation is reporting towards SDGs. So one of the weaknesses and gaps that we have seen is that the private sector's contributions are not integrated. It's just the state that looks at what they do and, you know, they uh, look at the targets and report against it. So we are concentrating on getting the companies uh, through their GRI, you know, reporting and, you know, other things that they do uh, to integrate uh, the t into the targets, Sri Lanka's targets, so that then they realize that they are also contributing towards the national conservation agenda. 
which is very important it's not like as anushka says dropping a mangrove and you know making it grow somewhere and going and saying i planted 100 trees for world environment day that is really not the thing so if they do something they they work towards the ndcs or they work towards the sdg targets that sri lanka has set itself for 2030 you know so that then it becomes one picture and then we become sustainable in that way so i think it's more and more important to integrate that everything is a whole and not in small small you know silos that we spoke of chalana can i get your views on this as well yeah sure just to piggy back on this what everybody's saying I, i really think it's about core business right regardless of what sector industry um it's really about recognizing that nature is at the core of all businesses and when that happens there will no longer be a sustainability department or head of sustainability which for the moment in corporate sri lanka that's quite well uh, well functioned and that's the way it's structured it's really looking at that as a speciality but it needs to be central for strategy and central from a uh, valuation perspective of the business you know if i'm exiting if i'm selling what what does this look like and that has to be core not just waiting for buyers in the west to say do this do that do this but saying hey actually this is what we bring forward on our own terms simply because this is our environment where we live where we're born into and it's regenerating those resources so if we take tourism for example you know there were moratoria that were put in because of the pandemic and the easter bombs etc on loans right and large loans were taken from MSMEs to large corporates to develop hotels during the boom post war but those moratorium had no recognition from the banking sector as to the ecological footprint and impact and what was quite beautiful last year during the fuel crisis or the resource crisis was to see that domestic tourism still functioned it didn't flourish or thrive but it was functioning based on the fact that nature based solutions were provided and we have a year round pleasant climate we've got all kinds of ecosystems as shrani mentioned so we've got plenty to offer where you can actually live without electricity surprisingly right you can you can deliver these solutions and if not renewables are uh, plenty plentiful right wave energy we look at waves just as a source for surfers but if we don't harness wave energy you know that will also be very short lived a lot of people spend their time doing meditation in the power outages the great thing is meditation is a high value experience for western markets there's a price on that right so we need to have the banking sector and the finance sector who are now really hit hard with this crisis recognizing and putting a value on that when they're underwriting when they're providing moratoria when they're providing funding to projects and that can be self made you know it's not waiting for international banking standards it's home grown solutions we have the brains we have the knowledge we have the talent we have the passion it's just that recognition as shirani said you know world environment today it's every day it's not one day right that's that's something that should continue and our our gdp will obviously show that eventually if there is a core business central focus on that thank you thank you chalna so we spoke of a lot of stakeholders the private sector the governments uh, finance companies randula if i turn to you who are the other stakeholders in this game uh, anyone we have missed and who's who should bear the bigger part of the pie if there is a stakeholder like that um i think i mean bearing uh, yeah the stake of a bigger part of the pie um with or without consent i would say is our generation uh, is our generation and and uh, the generations uh, next to come the millennials and the gen zers and um it's our good fortune that our generations and the generations that are upcoming is taking this taking the reins of it and embracing this and are willing to change a lot of things have been that have been practiced in the past 70 60 years um into the better part for for the country and and the communities so i think the bigger bigger responsibility um and the role is in the hands of the younger generation the millennials i think for us it's tough because we are the we are caught in between the transition um it's not easy but all of us i think have made that choice to remain in the country and to work in this sector to create that transition and transformation very consciously and to work with the old and the new players to build those bridges that's a major role that needs to happen nobody needs to be left behind nobody can be left behind it's all about really converting um and and transitioning into uh, the new economy which is a green economy that we could all embrace very soon and if you listen to um what was said across the panel 
I think it's very evident that the old era is over. It's a shift of uh, a new era from an economical perspective, from a financial perspective, from an ecological perspective, from a business perspective. And um, the, the people who are able to grasp that transition already is doing that work and that is the younger generation. And they're not essentially sitting in boardrooms. They're on the field, on the ground, working with communities, um, rolling up their sleeves and doing this work already. And what needs to happen is that these new ideas, fresh perspective and fresh energy more than anything needs to come into the boardrooms, needs to come into the policy making um, rooms where these conversations happen um, and that's when the shift will really begin to escalate and accelerate so that we can really go towards that transition very soon. Um, so essential thing is to get that energy perspective and, and efforts come into the mainstream, come into where decisions are made um, and private sector has a huge role to play here. In Sri Lanka especially, um, a lot of changes that we've seen in the past have been private sector led and this can also be that, um, not just um, large corporates but a lot of small and medium scale enterprises are really holding the reins of this and trying to make that shift happen and government always then comes along um, bringing in policies uh, that, that sticks and supports by creating an enabled environment so it's not just one, one group and one party playing the role needs to be a connected effort um, but I think it, it will it is going to be led by the future for the future, so it's it's uh, essentially the younger generation for me. Uh, seeing yes. this from a you know a long term perspective, uh, you know when I first started working for the environment, it was always one side was environment, one side was development. You know, it was two sides of a coin. But as time went on, what Randula say is saying became more and more evident, and these agencies that Sri Lanka, most of Sri Lanka belongs to the state. 70% of the country belongs to the forest ordinance and the fauna and flora protection ordinance, the Coast Conservation Act, you know, most of Sri Lanka belongs to the state. And if the private sector, for example, wants to do something within those areas, it was always very, very difficult because they were seen with great deal of suspicion. But today I can see trends changing. Now, and, and the younger generation in those officers also realize that unless you, uh, you know, look at it in a more integrated way, it is not going to function and they've realized that uh, finances are a little in government and, you know, you need more finances coming in uh, from other sectors. So we have seen a mind shift even in state officials and uh, imagine uh, us getting uh, you know a large hectare in the Carnelia conservation forest for the private sector to re, re uh, forest you know I mean that would never have happened years ago and uh, in the Anavilundava wetlands to Ramsar sanctuary we have got 50 hectares uh, for mangrove restoration and the private sector is putting the funds in so I think uh, you know in that same opti optimistic mode uh, that even the state is slowly realizing that working together makes more sense. Thank you, Shran. Yes. Yeah, just to add something on the role of the state, and I think while we, uh, I'm like everyone else on the panel, a firm believer that the private sector, um, entrepreneurs, however small or large they may be, will really be at the cutting edge of getting some innovative changes done. But we have to be mindful, and again, as Shirani said, the fundamental role that the state plays. And we don't want the state to abdicate its role, neither do we want to, it to overstep its role. So I think in this paradigm shift that we are looking at, where nature is valued better, nature is a key part of uh, growth, not a, you know, a side show, um, we need to reprioritize and realign what the role of the state is in, in all of this. And uh, the same way we have the central bank, which is the regulator and ensures financial system stability, and some of the best minds in the public sector get hired to the central bank. For me, the next source of instability is environmental instability. We can have well-regulated financial markets, financial system stability, monetary policy, all that is fine, but we are going to have immense climate instability, environmental instability, the link between that instability and social unrest. Who's looking at that at a macro level? Not a group of people just in one ministry, like the environment ministry, again, reprioritizing the role 
that environment and policy and regulation around the environment will play. We have some fantastic pieces of regulation, FFPO and others, I mean groundbreaking and they've been around for probably long, hundreds of years, longer than uh, many other countries have had these environmental protections. But implementation, resourcing of people, you know, you have uh, m money that's collected from national parks that go just go to the central treasury and get, you know, frittered away. Instead, you know, so even how we organize the government role when it comes to environment and conservation, how financial allocations are made. Ministries involved with smart regulation around um, nature and conservation shouldn't have to go and beg the Treasury Secretary for money every year or get you know crumbs left after the end of big allocations like to defense we have to completely rethink the role of the state while you know the private sector will invest the state has a role and if it if it kind of abdicates its role its role or if it's kind of really watered down to a bare minimum we're going to have problems because private sector that isn't so well intentioned will capitalize on that weakness private sector that is well intentioned and has good things that they want to do won't find a proper counterpart a capable, well-resourced, well-capable you know, capable counterpart. So I think we, um, we really need to focus on that. Uh, Anshka, we started talking about money and finances. Um, in April, we saw that the SEC introduced green bonds to Sri Lanka. How are instruments like this going to change the game? I think green finance and sustainable finance as a whole is going to be a huge part of our financial landscape over the next few years. Um, I, but I think we are still in very, very early days. Um, at an at a individual institution level, some of the banks are attracting finance from greener sources. Um, we have uh, the government at a macro level looking at a green bond framework at a sovereign instrument level. And we have global capital, plenty of pockets, and I'm sure Chalana, Shirani and others have come across these pockets of new capital that is looking to dis deploy in countries like ours for uh, around green investment, um, conservation efforts and so on. So I think on one hand, the money is out there like it has never been before, looking for good places to deploy it. In Sri Lanka, we have an abundance of potential projects, even if you want to narrowly define it as projects, that are ready to tap into this capital. I think the intermediation is still a little weak. And on one hand, we have the uh, private sector and institutions that could be part of this still getting out of the CSR mindset. I think they need to recognize that green finance isn't finance for you to come and do a reforestation. It is to the core of the business, right? Getting money uh, from these pots of money to deploy conscious capital in the country uh, in, in, in those sectors like agriculture or tourism that embody regenerative practices. Um, and I think that on the other hand, Sri Lanka needs to better tell its story to the world around the kind of projects that do exist or the kind of new investment opportunities. So long and the short of it is I think the capital is out there, initial steps internally being made, uh, but Chalner rightly pointed out, you know, this, this um, um, the, the banks, I think, play a key role. So I have a role, non-executive role, in a couple of financial institutions, and I think we are we are lagging behind. Um, we we still don't see uh, n nature and natural capital in the way it should. We probably don't do enough due diligence on projects that have negative environmental consequences, and we probably don't put enough of a value on those that adopt regenerative practices but may not fit into the neat bucket that we are used to classifying our businesses. So I, I think some of that will change but um, I, I firmly believe and I'm sure different people believe that the potential is in different places. I think if we transform the financial services industry it has a long way to go and I'll just end with a quick example of something we did last year. We worked with, uh, so the Centre for Smart Future, we worked with the Climate Disclosure Standards Board in the UK, which is now part of the IFRS Foundation, with the Columbus Stock Exchange to embed climate disclosure reporting in companies and about 250 listed companies participated. So it was a very early step, but it was a step towards recognizing that climate disclosure, cl the impacts of climate on your business, and now the latest is um, nature, not only climate, uh, needs to reflect in your financial reporting. 
because investors, as Chandler said, investors overseas are looking at those. They're not only looking at basic ROI, they're looking at how much you've embedded environment, both the risks as well as the opportunities in your business before deciding to give you the capital. Yeah, I think Anushka raised a great point, um, particularly with the financial institutions locally, where it's a question of awareness and acceptance. And I think it sounds like we already have reached certain per positions that people are accepting and aware, becoming aware of the inherent responsibility, but also the obligations, right? So there's a lot of regula regulatory restrictions in the West that will become an obligation to Sri Lankan companies as well, right? Where, how are you sourcing? How are you supplying? So the way investors are are looking at things will change. But I think there's the more human side to it that we often forget, especially when we discuss about reports and studies and research. I mean, now, if you look at what's happening at the rates of mental health uh, crises, burnout, sickness and illness, I mean, Colombo has a lot of first world amenities. It feels like a rich city, even in a crisis. But there's an extremely unhealthy population. You know, we're number one now for diabetes. We're very high up for kidney dialysis, all kinds of issues, right? If you look at it, very, at a very grassroots level, access to medication that's imported, that's quite expensive. So what do people do? They look at natural medicines, native medicines, Helaveda, Kama, Ayurveda, whatever it is. And that shows you that those are the solutions. And there's tremendous value to be tapped. And it's going back, in a, in a lot of times, back to those basics. And then refining it a little bit for the modern economic context. Tourism is doing a good job of that in a small way. But it's not about exploiting. Right? A lot of people who come here from cold climates, they go through rainforests for walks and they drink the water from the stream because it's so clean, pure and it's full of minerals. And you can feel that, right? We have a gem business, that industry, right? For centuries, why? That's a result of the terrain that we're blessed with. So it's not about exploiting, but I think that gem example is a great one because they see it, it's very extractive. But there's a reason for the quality and the purity of the stones in this country. So linking all of that, as Randula said, it's just putting that together and then you realize, oh wow, we have all the answers here. Let's not try and just replicate Western standards or Western regulations. Let's set our own, but then let's be accountable for it. Right? These kind of forums are good because what we're saying, we're now public and we're holding ourselves accountable. But getting a wider level of accountability across particularly Colombo corporates in the financial section will allow then at the grassroots level people to say, ah, okay, well, they're actually walking the talk, not just, you know, doing some mangroves and some forests, but they're embodying it in their lifestyle. So that is really where we need to see a shift. It's a cha change in the lifestyle domestically. And that will result in a change in business, naturally. And Shalne, Anushka was talking about getting out of the CSR mindset and that tick box, especially when we're telling Sri Lanka's story to the world. And now you spoke of communities and life-based solutions that are going to translate into bigger, bigger initiatives. Where can, where should this start? Yeah, I think that, you know the CSR. Even now, it's evolved to ESG because that's a reporting requirement, and there's a notorious amount of greenwashing happening globally. But there's also a huge amount of green hushing happening where people are doing the right things. A lot of the businesses that Randula's organization works with, I mean, SMEs, MSMEs at the grassroots level doing things that, you know, they fulfill all the criteria plus, 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 going above and beyond. But nobody's talking about it because of scale, because of publicity, because of lack of awareness, right? And it's not a, it really should be seen as, okay, we don't really care about CSR or certifications. In the tourism sector, we have a very low rate of certifications. I don't want to mention names of certification bodies, but that's a big industry globally. Fortunately, many operators in Sri Lanka are aware that actually we're doing better than the requirements. We don't need to sign up for that. So I think the move and the switch from CSR is happening. Um, it is going to happen at a faster rate when policy and financial institutions demand it but it's also as Randula kept mentioning the younger generation comes in they can see through a lot of this right and they are looking for traceability for accountability a lot of reforestation projects I've gone to visit you go it's not happening because you cannot just plant a sapling and leave it it needs to be nurtured which means there's huge human capital requirement right which means you need to continue to invest and it's better to do one acre properly than to do 25,000 hectares halfway. So young, the young people, the young kids, if I can say that, are really seeing that. And technology helps with accountability because you can photograph and say, hey, you said you're doing this, but it's not there. Look at the garbage on the street. 
look at, you know, so it will take a bit of time, but we need to put pressure and we need to be accountable for ourselves. Thank you, Chalna. Randula, talking about the role of SMEs and micro businesses, how do you see it happening? Can you share some examples from your experience? Sure. I mean, we've worked with about 100 entrepreneurs now who are um, I in the startup as well as the uh, small and uh, medium level. And a lot of the people we work with are people who are already on the path towards um, uh, having a regenerative organization. And these people honestly are doing the right things, even though the conditions economically are very harsh. To be doing this in a crisis economy um, is, is unimaginable almost, because the conditions are very dire, is very rough, um, and there's nothing here to recognize you, to reward you, to at least celebrate your story. Uh, for doing these things right and yet they're doing it right not to tick a ESG box or, or a CSR um, requirement uh, comply with the requirement but because they know that's the only way for them to go beyond surviving and to thrive um, it is only if their ecosystems are looked after if their people are look looked after if their communities are looked after will the organization be thriving and surviving for many longer years to come. And like Charana mentioned, um, however the camera and Ayurveda is, is one thing that we can turn into, but also it's what we consume day in, day out. Um, people who have access to the richest sources of nutrition here, unlike the Western countries, aren't the most richest people. Um, it is the rural communities that's got access to invaluable golden resources that they consume day in, day out, um, that they harvest and, and take from their backyard. So the SMEs um, that we work with have understood this potential and are doing a lot of things right already but like Chalana mentioned are in a green hush state because they don't know that this really holds a massive value in the eyes of the global consumer. They are just doing this right because it, it it's right and this is the only way they know how to do it and this is the brilliance of Sri Lankans really. Uh, this is this is what is inherent to us. We want to do good by the way that we um, nurture our nature and our communities. Um, but it's very important that they understand the value of what they do and how to position themselves in front of the right consumer without competing for another super supermarket shelf. So this is the value that we try to um, bring into their whole uh, whole journey. And um, there's plenty of examples that I can bring from uh, the the entrepreneurs we work with from coconut to uh, go to cola to um, uh, circular design and waste management. There's plenty. Thank you. I think we can move into the final part of our discussion. Uh, Chalana, in one of your comments, you said that World Environment Day should be every day. Um, so along those lines, how can we make World Environment Day every day, especially for Sri Lanka? Shiran, if I start with you. Well, I mean, I think he's that and I can only endorse that World Environment Day is every day uh, for us because environment has been ingrained in us from time immemorial and our forefathers brought environment into everything that we did. It's just that we forgot it along the way and uh, you know acted in silos. So now it's ob becoming obvious that it has to be done uh, and integrated in every aspect that we have. Now this year the theme of World Environment Day uh, is beat plastic pollution and I think that's one of unfortunately become one of the gravest environmental problems that we have amidst deforestation and habitat destruction, climate change, you know these sorts of things. So um, unfortunately we collect back a very minute percentage of plastics that we put out into the environment and it all boils down to community action you know and of course the corporates who actually manufacture the plastic so there is extended producer responsibility now coming into the picture uh, by way of you know, the manufacturer becoming more responsible for looking after the uh, plastic that comes out in the open we all have a huge responsibility uh, so you know it's all within us and although we celebrate this one day I think my message is that World Environment Day is every day. Thank you Shirani especially for shedding light on the red letter theme for this year thank you very much. Anushka? 
I think there are people around Sri Lanka for whom already World Environment Day is every day. Dedicated officers at the Ministry of Environment, Department of Wildlife Conservation, Forest Protection officers, for them World Environment Day is every day, that's their job. But they're not well resourced at all. They are often hugely burdened by political interference in their job. Businesses in Sri Lanka, there are some businesses, Shirani alluded to, to some that have truly embodied nature as a core part of their offering, the tourism offering or their product offering. They are living out world environment every day because they've realized this is my business now. I don't need to do a tree planting ceremony on world environment day. SMEs that Randula mentioned with its circular design or regenerative agriculture practices, they are living out World Environment Day every day. But then you also have communities who are very vulnerable to the fallout of poor environmental practices, whether that is bad waste management, whether that's water pollution. They are living out World Environment Day in a very different way every day because they are at the brunt of the damage of the environment, often with no fault of their own including in inner city communities here in Colombo. Urban poor um, are extremely vulnerable to uh, environmental degradation. So, I mean, I, I'd like to think of this idea of World Environment Day being every day uh, in those who are doing good stuff with it and they're living and breathing it every day. So for them, Environment Day is every day. But also th we have to spare a thought for those who are uh, at the br you know, taking the brunt of uh, not really considering the environment every day because their lived reality every day is uh, quite quite challenging. Randula, talking of World Environment Day being every day, what are your views on this? I mean, unconsciously, every time we sing the national anthem of Sri Lanka, we are marking the World Environment Day, and that's every day. It's, it's sung in this country somewhere right now, perhaps, right? Um, look at the lyrics, I think we did an entire video on this. The, the place that brings us luxury, beauty and, and sustenance. Um, it's, it's all in there, embedded in there and we've been singing it for decades and we've been living here for centuries um, without really truly recognizing and connecting uh, to that um, ecological um, live nerve that we have just here so I think it's it's all about looking within and connecting to our core without being shy without being restrictive and without building walls um, because this is our heritage this is our inheritance this is the time to embrace it um, and and it's not so hard because um, there's a lot of countries that are trying to course correct and it's a daunting task ahead of them in the West. But for us, it's just so close because we've really not gone too far down that um, downward spiral. We are just there. So it's just a matter of, you know, coming up and making it an upward spiral. So it's about being conscious about all of these things that we count as culture and heritage and uh, heritage. Um, and nature and really building that connection individually at an organizational level and then as an ecosystem at large and it's not so difficult if we just look at what's just next to us. Thank you Randula. Shalna, it, this was your line that World Environment Day should be every day. <laughs> can, can you have the last word? Well I think in the Sri Lankan context it's really exciting because we've got uh, fantastic natural groundwater resources, right? There are going to be and there already are conflicts for water. Right, we've got a year-round climate that we can live in without the need for temperature, artificial temp temperature regulation. We've got a mix of shade, cooling, wind. So we've got all the renewable sources provided by the powers that be. So I think the health and the wealth and the ability for Sri Lankans to thrive is all based on the health and the wealth of our ecosystems as an island. That's really uh, how I see it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Randula, Anshka, Shirani and Shalna for your inspiring words and your insights and for giving us a lot of thinking points this World Environment Day, which is going to be every day. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure having you. And thank you to all our viewers for joining us today. And until next time, happy World Environment Day. <laughs>